Hi, I am Iandra Smith Bryan, and I am your host of OnlyFans, the podcast where women can come together in a safe space and talk about all things evolving, growing, developing, leveling up. And I'm so excited that you've come back to join us because you are going to learn and grow and just have a good masterclass because I got some heavy hitters on this season. And I can tell you, this one here is a heavy hitter. She's my mentor. She's my executive coach, Shelly Archambault. Shelly Archambault is one of Silicon Valley's first female African-American CEOs, formerly an executive at IBM and a CMO at two public companies. Shelly was recruited to be CEO of a then struggling Silicon Valley startup, which is now metric stream or recognized global leader in governance, risk, and compliance software solutions. She currently serves as a Fortune 500 board member. She holds board seats at Verizon, Nordstrom, Roper Technologies, and others. And her debut book, which I love, and we're going to get into this, this, this episode, Unapologetically Ambitious, Take Risk, Break Barriers, and Create Success on Your Own Terms, is one of the best books of 2020, as stated by not me, but by Fortune magazine. So I'm excited to share Shelly with the world. Shelly, every single month, her and I get on our regularly scheduled coaching calls, and I can tell you, she turns me around. We're in learning season, guys. Let's get going. Let's welcome to OnlyFams, Shelly. Welcome to the OnlyFams podcast, Shelly. How are you? I'm doing great, Deandra. I've really been looking forward to this. Yes, I am so excited. And Shelly Archambault is one of Silicon Valley's first female African-American CEOs, uh, formerly an executive at IBM and CMO. Archambault was recruited to be a CEO at a then struggling Silicon Valley startup, which is now Metric Stream, a recognized global leader in governance, risk, and compliance. She currently serves as a Fortune 500 board member and holds board seats at Verizon, Nordstrom, Roper Technologies, and Okta. Her debut book, which I'm so excited. It's one of my favorite books, I told you, Shelly. I, I bought this book and I've given it to so many people. Unapologetically ambitious. Take risk, break barriers, and create success on your own terms is a book that I'm excited to dive into today and really to share with everyone. And it was featured as one of the best business books of 2020 by Fortune. So I'm excited. I'm excited to have you here. And I also want to add that you are my coach as well. So I feel like so completely honored that I get to really share you uh, with the world. Um, and so Shelly, I like to I like to start off these podcast interviews really by getting into your background a little bit. I, I just I'm just always so curious about how a person's upbringing really helped them to get to where they are. So tell me, how, how was it for you growing up as a child or a young adult? How did your bringing actually frame your journey and put you in the position of where you are now? Well, you're absolutely right in that my, upgrade, my upbringing absolutely shaped who I am. So I am the eldest of four children. My parents were crazy, Andre, they crazy because they had four children in less than five years. So it was just like, brrr, right, put us all out there. Uh, as the eldest, we grew up in a family that was very competitive, right? Because we were close in age, so we we're very competitive. And my father didn't have a college degree. And every time he had an opportunity to increase his earning potential, he took it. So as a result, we moved. We, I lived in seven different states Ooh. before I got to high school. So I was always that new kid having to break in. And oh, by the way, this was like the mid, late 60s, early 70s. And that's when civil rights was a very hot topic in the US. And frankly, for as many people who felt there should be civil rights, you had just as many that didn't. And we moved to some neighborhoods that were frankly, were not very friendly. So growing up, I got, I got bullied, I got beat up. I, it, was not, it was not good. So, you know, when things happen to you and you come home and you say, mom, mom, you know, this happened, they pushed me down, whatever it was, you know, it's not fair. My mother would say, Shelly, life's not fair. And as a kid, you're like, what are you talking about? I mean, things are supposed to be fair. You get a lollipop, I get a lollipop. You get a turn, I get a turn. Fair. No, really clear. Life is not fair. So what are you going to do about it? Right. And it was like, okay, so that was one. And then the second was because people said some terrible things to me, um, 
you know, she would say, Shelly, don't let them win. Don't let them win. She goes, if they win, if they make you change how you feel about yourself or change what you're going to do, then they win. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what they say to you. Just don't let them win. So if you put those two things together, I grew up realizing that life isn't fair and that peop other people should not be able to dictate what I do, mm -hmm. right? If I let them do that, then I let them win. And I told you, I grew up in a competitive family, so you don't let anybody win. <laughs> um, so what that did was it made me very intentional in my life, DeAndre. It made me set goals. It made me really work towards those goals. And I was able to, frankly, deflect naysayers, yeah. right? Because it was all this, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And even when people told me, I'm not probably not going to be able to do it, or that's not the right thing for me to do, et cetera. You know, I kept pushing forward. So as a result... You know, you talk about how it shaped me. It really set the stage for almost the resilience and the courage, you know, that I had as I pushed through in my overall career. Oh, wow. I love mama. I mean, mom, yes, just, mom me just gave you the best <laughs> advice that literally took you through your entire journey. You know, because think about how many of us really do go out into the world thinking, oh, well, life is supposed to be fair you know, all of us are on this level playing field and it shocks us when we realize that truly it isn't. And, and it's so funny that you say that all of this really formed uh, for you, this grittiness or this resilience. Uh, that, that's a factor that I think we often underestimate as to what is probably the most needed in leadership. And, and, and so I, I want to just continue going through your journey. As you, as you enter adulthood, you know, you're leaving the nest. Was there a plan? Did you know, okay, I, I want to be CEO. Um, how was it for you entering university? I mean, I, I know the story because I've read the book like 10 times. <laughs> but, but, but tell me, so, just, you know, 18 year old yeah, Shelly. So, absolutely. So the answer is yes, there was a plan. But it's interesting because I didn't have the full plan. You know, my family, it was all about get good grades so you can go to a good college so you can get a job. And once you get a job, you're kind of set, right? Yeah. So I've had that fateful conversation with my guidance counselor, you know, that junior year conversation of, are you planning to go to college? What do you want to do after college? And so I said, oh, that first question was easy. Yes, I'm going to college. What do you want to do after college? And I was like, honestly, I don't know. I just know I want to make enough money to keep my thermostat at 72 degrees in the wintertime. <laughs> I want to be able to eat out in restaurants and I want to be able to travel because those were all things I couldn't do growing up. And she laughed a little bit and then realized I was serious. <laughs> and then she said, well, what do you like to do? And I said, oh, that's easy. Clubs. I was in just about every organization in, in high school, right? I was in the American field service. I was in the French club. I was even a girl scout, but you know, don't tell anybody, right? Cause that was not cool. And I tended to lead them. I was president of this, vice president of that, you know, all those things. And so she said, oh, well, if you like clubs, clubs are like business. You pull people together and you get things done. And I thought, great, I'm going to go into business because I like clubs. And because I like running clubs, I'll run a business. And when I looked up, the people who run businesses were called CEOs. Oh. So literally, at like 16, I decided I'm going to be a CEO. <laughs> <laughs> I was that naive and that audacious. Did I know what a CEO actually did? No. <laughs> I love that you were that naive, though, because you like honed in on it. You know, it's like, OK, I want to be a CEO. Did, did people really think you were a bit crazy as you got older? I mean, were you telling everyone this dream? I want to be a CEO. Well, you know, it's interesting. Well, it's interesting. You know, I definitely told some people, you know, early on because I decided I wanted to go to a business oriented school. So I went to Wharton. And then um, I remember just summer jobs, telling people that's what I wanted to do, right? But what I found is when I actually got into workforce, I probably shouldn't tell everybody I want to be CEO. <laughs> so when I joined IBM, I remember telling someone, they said, oh, welcome, da da da, -da. you know, what do you want to do? And I told her, I want to be CEO one day. And she gave me this look, right? A picture. I'm like 22 years old, oh, yeah. right? Um, and... I thought, hmm, okay, maybe I shouldn't say CEO. <laughs> so then what I started doing, when people asked me what I wanted to do, I just picked a job two levels up. 
right? I just told them two levels up. Mm-hmm. So, oh, well, one day I'd love to run, be a manager, right? And then one day I'd love to run a branch. And then I'd like to run a division. So I just kind of used two levels up versus telling people CEO. Yeah. Um, and they're because like- some people just make them uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> you could imagine 22 year old Shelly like, Oh, I want to be CEO. And they're like, who does she think she is? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Here's the funny thing. Younger. The woman that I told I wanted to be a CEO, we are friends to this day. Oh. And she tells people and she tells people, Shelly told me when she was 22, she wanted to be CEO. <laughs> that, that is amazing though, that she didn't look at you with like, Oh, she, how could she have the confidence? But she actually saw you know, think about it. You had this ambition. Yeah, well, yeah I saw the Yeah, but she, but she was skeptical. When I told her, she was skeptical. <laughs> it was, like I said, the reaction on her face told me, hmm, maybe I shouldn't tell everybody that high. Oh, my God. That's, a, that's amazing. And, you know, you start off the book, well, specifically in part two, you talk about strategizing. So many people, you know, so many young professionals, and I'm just even thinking about my journey. You know, you start your career, but we don't really strategize. <laughs> it's like, we're kind of wondering, you know, uh, even though you may have an idea of what it is that you desire, it's like, how do you actually connect the dots to make it happen? So how did you go through, you know, you have the dream of being a CEO, strategizing for that, building that. How did you make it happen? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. My whole focus has always been how do I improve my odds to get what I want? Because I knew that the odds were not in my favor, right? I mean, I'm a black girl in tech, all right? I mean, back in the 80s, odds were not in my favor. So everything I did was, all right, how do I improve my odds? So the way I thought about it was to ask myself, all right, what's the goal? I want to be a CEO. All right, so what has to be true for me to become a CEO? Well, frankly, I didn't know, right? I didn't know. So when I ask myself that question, I then have to go do the research. Who are the CEOs? What educational backgrounds did they have? What jobs did they have before they became CEOs, right? What was their life like? I was doing all this research to try to understand what's the path. And then once I've done the research, then I ask myself, okay, how do I make this true for me? And so for instance, I decided to go to a business school because when I looked, a lot of the CEOs had MBAs, they had degrees from high ranking universities. And I said, all right, improve my odds. Not everybody did, but again, I'm a woman, right? I'm black. I need to make sure I've got the best pedigree I can possibly have. So that's why I went to a top business school. And then two, I did something very unusual. I started my career at IBM in sales. Mm. Now I will tell you, Andrew, all my friends at Wharton were like, you're crazy. I mean, nobody graduates from Wharton and becomes a salesperson. You're going to sell computers. Yeah. You're supposed to go off to like Wall Street and be an investment banker, right? Or a financial analyst or a, you know, Procter and Gamble product manager. I mean, all these cool, sexy, right? Kind of jobs. Yeah. And I'm going to go sell computers. What's wrong with me? But the reason I chose that job is because I was targeting IBM and every single CEO at IBM started out in sales. Mm. So I said, all right, I don't know why that happens, but that must be the path to power. Again, I want to improve my odds. So let me get on the path that others have taken, right? That's gotten them there. And that's why I started out in sales. And I'll tell you to this day, starting out in sales was the best thing I ever did. Mm. I use more of the skills I learned when I was a salesperson throughout my career. And even to this day, than any other job I've had. So doing the homework is really critical. And then putting the plan in place based upon that homework Mm. is critical. But the, the key point is to actually make decisions based upon the plan. A lot of people set goals. Some people take the time to sketch out, okay, here's how I might achieve this plan. But what I find is very few people make decisions every day consistent with what they're trying to do. Oh, yes. yes. And that's where the power is. Oh my gosh, that that's so profound. I mean, that that's so that's so deep. So you you had this vision. I want to be CEO. And then you you actually went out and said, "Okay, well, how can I make this happen?" And you did your research, and so many of us don't do that. 
And I'm just thinking, you act, you've actually kind of given, <laughs> given us a secret for how we can go about designing the life of our dreams. Because so many, think about how many young professionals are just sitting there saying, I have no idea how to get to where I want to be. Well, well, the starting point of the design is to first set out the vision and then to look around and actually do the research and see how other people have done it. Now, what, what do you tell people who don't even have just, they haven't even thought about what that vision is? You know, I, I've had people come to me and say, I have no idea what it is I want to be, what I want to achieve, what I want to accomplish. They literally have no idea. Where do they begin? Yes, exactly. And you're right. It's true for a lot of people. What I, here's what I tell them. If you don't have a goal in mind, you know, not sure what you want to do, then just build skills that are in demand. Oh, okay. Just build skills that are in demand. Because if you don't know, then it almost doesn't matter. So pick areas that are hot. And the reason you want to pick areas that are hot is so let's like right now, for instance, if you were to get involved in what's hot, you know, AI Walking is hot. AI. Is hot. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, technology is hot. Um, there are even some areas in, um, that there really need skills and data analytics. I mean, all kinds of things, right? Yeah. So pick something that's in demand. Just pick it and start doing it. And then once you do it, you'll build skills. You may find that you actually like it. And that's great because it's in demand. And now you can kind of build on that. You might find you don't like it. But you know what? That's okay. Because if it's a skill set that's in demand, it'll be easy for you to pivot to a different company or a different area because the skill is in demand. Mm. So if you're not sure what you want to do, then just start building skills in demand until you figure it out. Oh. If you build skills that aren't in demand, it's going to be harder for you to then move forward once you do figure it out. So I tell people, treat it like you're in college. Meaning when you're in college, you have to take a lot of courses that you don't necessarily want to take. It's not like you say, oh, yes, I absolutely want to take statistics, no. right? I mean, but you have to take it because it's a core class. Well, think of the beginning of your career. If you don't know what you want to do, it's the same thing. You're building up a set of core capabilities so that when you're ready, you can leverage them to help propel you in your career. Oh, that's such good advice. That, 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 that is amazing advice, Shelly. That I... I wish somebody would have said that <laughs> back then, um, because think about it. How many of us are allowing other persons to drive the wheel and tell us what to do or, or, or you know, oh, well, maybe you should do this, but we're not really being intentional and really thinking. And so I think what you're saying is just just to actually begin to think uh, in order to design the yeah. life of your dreams. Um, so yeah, because here's the key. Yeah, here's the key. The key is. You own your career. Oh, you do. Yes. Not your boss, not your mentor, not your coach, not your spouse, right? Not HR. Mm. You own your career. But I find that most people spend more time thinking about their vacation plans than they do thinking about their career. Oh, you which is crazy. Because you just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's crazy because you're going to go on vacation once or twice a year, but you're living your career for your lifetime. So no, no, it's, I mean, Deandra, you, you would never like, um, spend $5,000 for an airline ticket, right? Pack your bags, let your friends know you're going to be away, put the dog in the kennel, drive to the airport, get on the plane, strap in that seatbelt, and then look at the pilot and say, so where are we going anyway? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. But we yeah. do that with our careers all the time. We spend money and time and education and training and coaches and conferences and we're building all these skills and all these capabilities and all this investment. And then we don't take charge. We wait and let somebody else figure out where we should go, what we should do. That's nuts. Yeah. Absolutely nuts. Oh. You own your career. Take the driver's seat, take the wheel and steer it. Think about what you want to do with the, with your life. Oh, you have a story in the book about this, about, you know, you were approaching 30 and I love it because you had your plan, you, you had your Excel spreadsheets, you knew exactly where you were going and you were owning it. <laughs> and you had the plan. I need to be marketing manager by this date in order to get to branch manager. And the environment at the time, it didn't seem like your manager was very supportive of you going, or maybe, maybe you didn't ask enough questions. Can you just tell us a little bit about that story? Cause I, I found that story pretty interesting and, and pretty insightful. 
Sure. So uh, there were two. So I'll tell the one that I'm thinking, I think you're talking about, which is, so here I am. Um, my plan is to become a branch manager. And I determined what steps I needed to get there. And I was doing well. But all of a sudden, I was at the step where I needed my next level management job before I got to the branch manager. And although I've been told that I was doing a good job, that yes, I've been supported, like no promotions were coming. Yeah. And I asked about it. I qualified. I said, well, what else do you need to see from me? And all those kinds of things. Like, no, no, you're doing a great job. You're ready. We, we just don't have an opportunity yet. We just don't have an opportunity yet. Well, almost a year later, we just don't have an opportunity yet. Well, listen, tick tock, yeah. tick tock. I've got a plan and the key to a plan is having a timeline because it forces you to stay on course. So I looked at this and went, okay, if, you know, if the company doesn't have a role for me, right, then I'm going to have to do something else. But before I did something else, I went to go talk to my second line manager. So my boss's boss. Oh, yes. All right. Okay. And in talking to my boss's boss, Right. Same thing. I just want to qualify. I said, oh, Shelly, you're doing a great job. You're doing this, the whole bit. I was living in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at the time. And um, I said, well, I'm really you know, concerned because I feel that I'm ready to be promoted. My boss is telling me I'm ready to be promoted, but there aren't any jobs available for me. And he said, yes, that's right. There's just aren't jobs available here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I looked at him and said, what do you mean in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania? I mean, IBM has offices all over the world, right? I said, he said, well, we assumed you weren't willing to move. Oh, assumptions. <laughs> right. And I said, I am willing to move. Well, you know, your husband works here. And I mean, again, they made assumptions that because I'm working, because my husband's working, that I wasn't willing to move. Nobody ever said that to me. They never clarified, but I didn't understand why there weren't opportunities. Now I understood because they were looking at a very small area. Once he understood that I was willing to move, right, mm -hmm. then... I got the opportunity. So it's really important to make sure that you're actually qualifying and that you're pushing. If I had just waited and waited and waited, years could have gone by oh. before I got what I needed. And then I'd be so far behind, right, on my overall plan. So have a timeline. And then the other thing is earlier in my career with an earlier role, um, it turned out they didn't have opportunities for me because the company's going through a challenging time. And I actually almost left the company. Mm. I mean, I actually found a different job and I came in and resigned. And they were like, why are you leaving? Because you told me there aren't opportunities for promotion. And, you know, I'm doing a good job and I have a plan and, you know, a whole bit. Well, they found an opportunity for me. So it's really important to take control of your career, to qualify how you're doing and to let people know, you know, what you expect. I I'm, think I'm ready for promotion. Am I ready? Are you, do you see what you need to see? Have I done what you need me to do? Am I delivering? Right. And as long as all those answers are yes, mm -hmm. then it's fine for you to ask for what you believe you deserve. I love that. I, I, I that story was amazing to me. It's, it's the first story you actually told. And I think because so many times we're, we're actually thinking, oh, well, they said there's no opportunity. Well, there's nothing I can do about it. Like it's out of our control. And we never even think, well, maybe there's something to clarify, or maybe I should ask more questions, uh, you know, but we're perfectly fine just allowing, you know, others to direct our career and, and, and sort of drive our car, as we say. And even when it comes to training exactly. and development, um, a lot of times I've had people come to me and say, well, my company doesn't have the funding to, you know, for, for me to go and pursue the certification. What do you say to that? You know? To someone who's like, well, yes. I want to do something, but they don't have the money or it's not in the budget. Mm -hmm. It's all about looking at, are there different ways to get the training? I mean, for instance, I think about it as driving. If you get in your car and you're heading to the grocery store and you come to a, a roadblock, maybe they're doing construction, something's happening. You would never just say, oh, well, I guess I can't go to the store. Yeah. Turn off your car and sit there. Right? Nope. You wouldn't do it. What do you do? You pull out your phone. Okay, is there a different path, right? Is there a different way to get there? It might be a little longer, might be a little indirect, but you are going to go to the grocery store. Am I right? Exactly. We're going okay, <clears throat> so we will, be, we will be resilient and we'll be intentional to go to the grocery store. But for our careers, they say, oh, I'm sorry. No, blah, 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 blah. And we say, okay, and we park our cars and we sit there. For 10 years. That's ridiculous. <laughs> All right, it's ridiculous. No, 
I mean, if there's a training that you want that the company can't pay for, okay, is there a different way to get that same skill set, mm -hmm. right? Is there somewhere else to find the funding? It, you know, can you make a trade-off, right, on something else that you're doing? I mean, just it's just look at it from different perspectives. Don't just say, oh, well, and wring your hands. Yeah. Look at what are different ways of getting there. It might be a bit more security. It might take a little longer. Might I mean, who knows? But it doesn't matter. The key is don't park your car and sit there, right? Keep moving. Keep moving. And keep, you, you are focused on this vision of CEO, you know? And so you are prepared to swerve, as you say, you know? Exactly. Even, even if how you imagine getting there look different, the whole focus was, I'm going to get there. And, and exactly right. And I'm just thinking so, so many times we look at our career like this ladder. It's like, okay, step one, step two, step three. We, you know, we're in the same company. We don't pursue other opportunities in other cities or jurisdictions. We're not doing it right in that sense. Right. Because I mean, when I look at your journey, your journey was so, it was focused on the vision, but there were so many things that happened along the way that resulted in you pivoting. You swerved as you went along. Uh, one of my favorite stories out of your book, I'm sure you get this a lot, the blockbuster story. <laughs> uh, you know, so you decide, okay, you know, the CEO opportunity isn't happening at IBM. Um, you worked your way up pretty, pretty high. I think the only black female leader at the time, you had done international assignments, uh, but you take this opportunity at Blockbuster and you have this incredible vision for, for Blockbuster. You know, what it's going to be, bringing the technological component and it's interesting to me because you pretty much knew early on, and I'll let you, I'll let you speak about the specific incident that, okay, this is not going to work for me, but you had already moved your family there. You had already moved your family there. Your husband, your two children are there. How do you then pivot or swerve from, from that location? <laughs> exactly. You know, the key is in your career, things don't always go according to plan, but that's okay. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have a plan. Having a plan helps give you a framework for making decisions. So you're right. I took the job at Blockbuster. I was president of Blockbuster, moved my family from Tokyo to Dallas, Texas. And about six months in, seven months in, I have the opportunity. I met Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix. Uh, because we're at the same their conferences, the whole bit. He has got a company that he's building technology to help address movie rentals, right? I've got a company that does movie rentals, but they're trying to build technology to be able to do it in a different, more efficient way. So he and I got together, he came out to Blockbuster and pitched, let's take Blockbuster the brand, because it was a very strong brand. Let's take Netflix technology, put those two together and go conquer the world. And my boss said, mm, if that ever turns into anything, we'll just buy it, basically. Well, you know, it was one of those things where you're like, oh my goodness, I've just moved my whole family to Dallas. I'm in tech. There aren't many tech opportunities in Dallas in the, when well, this was the nineties. Okay. Uh, late nineties. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to make a change. I, it's, it's not going to work here. So I figured I had to get myself to Silicon Valley. That's where everything was happening. That's where there were plenty of opportunities but I just moved my family. So yes, you talk about pivoting. It was a long conversation, you know, with Scotty to come home and say, Ooh, this isn't the opportunity I thought it was going to be and blah, blah, blah. So we talked about it and decided that I would pursue an opportunity in Silicon Valley, but I'd commute. So I'd leave the family there so they could stay stable there for a few years. And I would commute. So literally I commuted for three years mm -hmm. from Dallas, Texas to Silicon Valley where I was the chief marketing officer and EVP of sales for two public companies before I got the CEO opportunity at Metricstream. And once I became CEO, we moved uh, to, to Silicon Valley. Oh, that must have been so hard, right? Because you're like, man, I, I, can't, I can't stay here. You know, the vision that I have for the company is not, it's not going to align with my boss's vision. Mm -hmm. And this is not the opportunity for me, but then you have to reconcile that with your family and your family's plan. And Scotty, oh gosh, he, I wish I would have known him or met him because the way you describe yeah. him, he just seems to be, and Scotty is, is your husband, Shelly's husband, uh, who, who since passed away, but was a rock of the family. 
um, I just can't imagine, you know, how, how, how you would have been able to achieve the CEO vision had he not been so present in the family. So I just want to hear about how did you make the family vision and your own personal professional vision truly come together and align? Uh, and and what, what, what is the part of a, a supportive partner or a supportive network in all of that? Yeah, no, first of all, it's a huge part. And when people ask me, what's, you know, what are the most important decisions you made for your career? The first one I always mention is marrying Scotty. Mm -hmm. So picking the right life partner. Now, it wasn't an accident. When I was <laughs> Not looking like at doing with Shelly. <laughs> exactly, I know, but I just had to say it wasn't an accident. Um, so I had actually, crazy woman that I am, in college, I actually made a list of what I felt I needed in a life partner. And then I whittled it to what I absolutely have to have, right? So, because first you start out with this long list of like 30 things and that's ridiculous. Nobody can do that, right? So I whittled it down, whittled it down. I got it down to about, I don't know, 12 things. I wish I kept the list. Uh, when Scotty asked me to marry him, I actually gave him the list. It was too funny. But um, anyway, but it was, and the reason I made the list is I wanted to be, again, intentional about what I was looking for because I wanted a life partnership. I wanted to marry someone and have a long-term marriage. And the good news is my parents had modeled that for me. So I knew it was possible, but I also knew that you have to find somebody that shares a common vision for life. So... Anyway, making my list was really helping me figure out not only this common vision, but also what I could live with. Like, for instance, on my list, I wanted to marry somebody who cooked. Ooh. All right. That was important to me. It was, it was a showstopper. And why? Because I like to eat, but I didn't want to do all the cooking. It's not going to work. Not with the career aspirations I have. We have to share in this stuff. So I needed somebody who, who could cook, need somebody who would, would clean. And what I mean by would clean, meaning not could clean but would clean. So when I was dating people, you look to see how clean they are, right? What do they do? Do they actually proactively clean stuff up or do they not? It's that, that's what I mean. Do they see it? So anyway, I had a list of all these different things. Um, <clears throat> one of the items on my list was how do they treat their mother? Because I'm a big believer that how a man treats his mother is how he will eventually treat you as a spouse. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I always look for that. Anyway, in doing that, when I was dating, if I if somebody suddenly showed that they weren't meeting something on the list and I couldn't make, they wouldn't be a you know, lifetime partner, I stopped dating. Not because there was a problem or an issue, but because I felt, gosh, if I was dating somebody that I knew wasn't life partner material, I might miss a life partner person when they come by. So anyway, that's what I mean by it wasn't really an accident. I was trying very hard and Scotty came along and it was amazing. He indeed, you know, check, check, check. Now he had a lot of things that were also concerning because the key is when you make your list, you have to decide what you're willing to live with. He was a lot older than me, but you know what? We had an amazing marriage. We were married almost 35 years before he passed away. Oh, that's incredible. Oh, that's incredible. Oh, I mean, you had such an incredibly supportive partner who literally was there every step of the way. And I believe Scotty even told you when it was time to leave IBM and get, yeah, and get, get you back on your journey. Exactly. Yeah, because that's the key. We treated, we treated my career goal as our career goal. Yeah. Right? I mean, before we even got engaged, he knew that I wanted to be a CEO one day. So he knew what that meant, right? So all of those things, it's so important to share what your visions are for life, you know, how you want to live, Make sure you have similar um, outlooks, you know, on life, because then it makes it a whole lot easier to deal with issues, challenges, to make decisions, to agree on what the right trade-offs are when you have a common vision. So we treat it as, as a partnership. That's why I said I want a life partner. We treat it as a partnership. So my promotions, my wins were our wins and our promotions, right? And he celebrated just as much as I did. Yeah. And having, having Scotty as a supportive partner, which was you, you, priceless, you can't, you can't put a price point on that, but having him as the father of your children who actually made a huge sacrifice, he decided to stay home 
to really help support you in that career. Do you think that you could have still made it to the the CEO suite had he stayed in the stayed in his career? Uh, how how would you have made that work, or do you think that was truly pivotal for you? Well, I want to be really specific <laughs> and happy for me. Yeah. <laughs> right. And what I mean is for me, um, it was really important to me and it was actually something that I, I wanted. And we talked about it again before we got married that I, I really wanted and was willing to make the trade-offs necessary so that he could stay home right at some point. And he agreed with that. So we were in line for that. And the reason I say our decision, my decision is because I, I'm not saying at all that two working spouses, right, cannot have one go on and be CEO. That's not the case at all. Right. You just need more help. You just need more help um, in terms of to do that. But that was the decision that we made that he would do that. So, and what that meant was when he started staying home, I mean, we used cars, really small house. We didn't take vacations. Yeah. I mean, because all of a sudden money went from two incomes to one income, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of trade-offs that you make when you make a decision like that. So you're doing it for reasons, right? That are important to you as a couple. So yes, it was important to us, but I don't believe it for one minute that that's required in order to be successful. Yeah, I mean, I, I one thing that I actually learned from you that is forever change, you know, the way I work is this notion of work-life integration. Uh, you know, so sort of bringing your work and your personal life together and just being your whole self. Uh, you gave some incredible tips because I know you hate the word balance and, and I get it. I don't know why the term is, <laughs> why we believe that we can actually balance, you know, like it's some kind of weight that we can balance work or personally. And if it's not balanced out, we're failing in some respects. Uh, but work-life integration really is crucial. How can you, or, or what advice would you give to, to young professionals, young females? We actually have some single mothers that, that, that follow uh, the podcast that really do have these incredible lofty goals um, but, but are struggling with finding their network. You know, where, where do they go with finding that support, but also really bringing about more effective work-life integration? Sure. So work, just to frame it, work-life integration to me is all about putting your priorities, the personal priorities, the professional priorities, putting those together and then reprioritizing ruthlessly, yeah. ruthlessly so that you get done what's important across your life. And what that means is there are going to be some things that you aren't going to get done and you either have to find somebody else to do them or just learn to live without them getting done, which also means because the only way to live with that is if you're willing to let go of the guilt. So we are very judged in this world. Yeah. Women, especially we are very judged. We're judged. I mean, or at least we feel judged. We feel judged on, you know, how we look, what we wear. We feel judged on our jobs, on what cars we drive, how our kids look, maybe who our partner is. We feel judged on what vacations we take. We, I mean, everything we do, how our house looks, is it clean, is it neat, is it decorated nice, right? I mean, all these, all these things we feel judged. And because we feel judged, we feel we have to actually do them all. Because if we don't do them all really well, we're going to be judged negatively. And that's what drives this guilt, right? Well, in order to actually prioritize, we have to be willing to let go of the guilt. Yeah. And the only way I've found to let go of the guilt is to decide consciously what I'm willing to be judged on. All right. I decide, not the world. I decide, you know, I tell a story in the book about my daughter. So my daughter was born with very thick curly hair. So what do you do with her hair as it starts to grow long? You brush it, you comb it, you part it, and you braid it. Put little bows, ribbons, right? We all seen that. Yeah. Now, do I know how to do that to little girl's hair? Absolutely. <laughs> because at one point my hair was long, right? And curly, brushed, braid, all of it. Did my late husband, all six foot two, former football player, big hands, could he part and plait and make pretty all this? No, he didn't know how to do that. Did he have to learn? You betcha. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, while he's learning, 
you know, he's trying to do her hair. Parts are crooked, one thick braid, one skinny braid, you know, braids coming unraveled. She would leave home with her hair looking pretty jacked up, <laughs> okay? Yeah. And now, do I know that when she got to school, now this is preschool, do I know when she got to school, people looked at her and thought, where is her mother? How could they let her out of the house looking like that? I'm sure they did. But you know what? I wasn't going to feel guilty about it. Why? Because Scotty needed to learn how to do her hair. And if I redid it after he did it, he'd say, fine, you do it. Right? He was learning. And I'll tell you, after about a month, he got pretty good at it. Right? She started looking better and better and all was fine. Now listen, she doesn't care what her hair looks like. She's three, four years old. They do not care. All right? So all of the guilt that you can feel about, oh my gosh, she's going out not looking. Why are you feeling that guilt? You're feeling guilt because you're feeling judged, not because she feels badly. She doesn't care. Right. So give up the guilt. People outside, they don't know what's important to you. They know what's important to your family. To our family, it was important that Scotty learned how to do her hair. And eventually he did. She's 38 years old right now, three kids of her own. Did this hair incident affect her, her life or her? No. All right, so you decide what you're willing to be judged on. Let go of the rest. This is your life. It's not their life. Oh. You decide. And once you decide that, then you can prioritize and you can let go of things. Oh, I love that. Give up the guilt. You know, stop, stop trying to live your life the way you think other people want you to live your life. You know, focus on, and you said priorities, focus on what are the priorities right now? You know, to everything, there's a season. And so as season changes, priorities change. And so we think about what are the, what are the priorities in this season? You know, if I have a sick child, that may be my priority right now, but think about that and, and actually lean into whatever that priority is. I, I love that. So everybody's listening to Shelly and you just sound like you had it all together. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you were a junior in high school. You, your guidance counselor said, oh, CEO. And you're like, okay, I'm going along. You know, I'm, I'm going to be the CEO. You found this amazing husband. Everything just seemed to fall in place. You know, so often when we're looking at people's lives, we're like, wow, you know, her life is just incredible. But I always like to ask about the, the obstacles, you know, those, those hard moments, those things that we really didn't see. Did you ever face incredible obstacles that you thought would really push you totally off course? You know, and if so, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, the first one, first one was in my late twenties. So here I am. I'm now married. I already have two children. I've been I'm at IBM. I've been promoted a couple times. I just get named to my first nonprofit board of directors. I mean, outside looking in, Shelly looks like she's got it going on, right? Everything's just kind of, she said, falling in place, all easy, the whole bit. I felt terrible. I felt terrible. All of a sudden, you know, it was hard to get out of bed. I was always tired. I just felt I'd lost the momentum in my step. I really had to work on being positive and, you know, really work at trying to, um, you know, be present, you know, for my kids. And I'm mean, just like, what, what is going on with me? What is wrong? I mean, if this is how I'm going to feel as a result of getting everything that I thought I wanted, then maybe I don't want this. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. But I kept thinking, something's wrong. This is just not me. So I went to go see a psychologist. And what I learned through those sessions was that I had been giving up 100% of myself for everyone else. Oh. I was giving all of myself to the job, to the family, to my spouse, to the community, right? I mean, you asked me for something and I did it. You needed something and I gave it. I was giving it all away. I was doing nothing to actually feed myself, to feed my soul, to feed my mental health, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so I was depressed. I didn't even know what it was, right? But I was depressed. The good news is I went to get help. So I figured out what it was. So I didn't step out of my career. What I did was spend time learning what do I need for self-care? How do I take care of myself? And what I learned is I need three things. I need to eat three meals a day. And I know that sounds ridiculous. Like, of course, breakfast, lunch, dinner. No, 
Most people do not eat three meals a day. Yep. And when I say meals, yep. I, don't, I don't mean a cup of coffee and a bagel, <laughs> right? I mean a meal. I mean something that's healthy, right? Good for you, three meals. So three meals a day. And even as a CEO, I took my lunch to work if I didn't have a lunch meeting. And the reason I did it was not because I couldn't afford to buy lunch, but it was because what I found is if I got busy, all of a sudden I'm at the vending machine, right? I don't have time to go actually get something to eat that's good, or I'm just grabbing something fast, which is probably not very healthy. So bringing lunch made sure that I ate healthy meals. So I, non-negotiable, three meals a day. Two, I need to exercise regularly. And for me, it's kind of like four or five days a week. And then number three, I need adult interaction, social interaction, twice a week, at least twice a week. So I've got to figure out how to do all that. And if I do that, if I eat three meals, if I exercise, and if I have my adult interaction socially twice a week, I can deal with just about anything that comes at me. So I've never suffered from depression since. So the answer is, were there obstacles? Absolutely. Here's the key. Whenever you face an obstacle, if you're just feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm either not cut out for it, I can't do it, you know, whatever it might be, go get help. Yeah. And if it's not a psychologist because you're not comfortable, find at least find a, a friend or a confidant, right? Someone that you can trust, but go get help because here's the key. That's not you. There are other things going on that you need to deal with because you are more than capable to do whatever it is you need to do if you are strong mentally and physically. Oh, I love that. I love that so much. Self-care. You need to be the best version of yourself if you're going to be able to give or pour out of your cup to others. You can't show up like the best version of yourself if you're not first nourishing yourself. I love that. And I love how in this book, Shelly, I mean, you just, you just as a whole, you're just very authentic and very transparent because a lot of people often, you know, they may be embarrassed of moments like this, or they may not want to talk about moments like this, but you really were candid. And so that really is telling me and everyone else that's reading the book that we're not alone. You know, if Shelly could navigate through this and get to where she is and become who she is, then we could also. So I, I'm, I appreciate it. I'm so grateful for that. Absolutely. And that's honestly, that's why I wrote the book because too many books I just felt, you know, were written as, okay, I took step one, step two, jumped a little hurdle, step three, and boom, it all happened. And, you know, nobody tells you that life is hard, right? Nobody tells you life is hard. Well, guess what? Life is hard. And the reason it's important to say it is because when all of a sudden it gets hard for you, we think, oh my God, I'm not cut out for it. I'm not good enough. I'm not whatever enough. And that's just not true. Life is hard for everyone. They just don't tell you it is. Yeah. All right? So if it's hard for you, welcome to the club. If it's hard, it means you are pushing. It means you are learning. It means you are growing. Yeah. If it's not hard, it means you're standing still. So it's okay that life is hard. Get help, get support, but keep moving forward. Yeah. Oh, life is hard. Life isn't fair. <laughs> Move forward. I love that. So let's talk financial freedom because the reason why I really started OnlyFems was honestly, I was just tired of, I felt like, you know, women, uh, we, we were never really talking about financial independence and financial freedom and wealth. And I was constantly seeing, you know, my male friends or my male colleagues talking about it. And I just felt like, man, we're missing out. Uh, and, and I really wanted to start a dialogue where women could come together in a safe space and really talk about wealth and financial independence and growth and development. Um, and so I'm just curious, what is one piece of advice that you would give to women that want to become financially independent? Align your financial spending with your goals. I, that probably sounds like crazy. It's like, <laughs> well, of course, but I'm telling you, most people don't. When, before Scotty and I even got married, we created a budget and in our budget, the first line item of expense on the budget was childcare. It was not a house. It was not a car. It was childcare. Why? Because we were both working. I had high aspirations. 
So we needed good childcare. So we literally spent more on childcare than we did for the place we lived. All right. You have to align your spending with your goals. When you align your spending with your goals, then you're able to make the right trade-offs. Because if one of your goals is one day you want to own a house and you know, therefore you're going to have to save up that deposit, right? That you need the down payment. Well, fine. Align your spending so that you're putting money away over whatever period of time it is you're trying to work toward you get the house, right? Align your spending with your goals. When you don't, what happens is you don't have the financial flexibility to do the things you need to do when you need to do them. Yeah. And you get trapped. And that's why so you, gotta align, know your goals. you have to know your goals. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Align your spending with your goals is my number one advice. Oh, that's great advice. And, and if you know your goals and you're laser focused on your goals, you're not distracted by anybody else's goals, you know, because we can look at social media and we can see the fancy cars and the fancy houses and, and the Gucci bags and this and that. But if our goal is that we want to move up in the organization, are we, are we really putting in place those line items, like you said, that are going to ensure that we get there? So that, that, that's exactly. a fundamental piece of advice. I love that so much. Okay, so it's time for rapid fire. <laughs> and, All right, uh, I'm ready. I, I love this part of, of the podcast. I like to conclude all my interviews with this rapid fire, just quick, just quick digestible ways that women can up level themselves, you know? So, so some quick tips. So, I'm going to say a word and I want you to say how a woman can either improve herself in that area or maximize space in that area, thereby allowing her to level up. So the, okay. the first word is books. And, I, and I'll just, I'll just, it it? <laughs> I was going to say unapologetically ambitious. <laughs> uh, the, the other one that I'll say is um, how to ask, how to ask for anything. I believe it's what it's called. Uh, Wayne Baker, but it's basically, it basically te teaches you how to ask for the help you need, how to ask for what you want. How to ask. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to have to get that book, <laughs> put that on my, <laughs> put that on my reading list, but Shelly's book, unapologetically ambitious. I'm going to actually include the link in the bottom of the video. Oh, you can also you. find it. Yeah. On Shelly's website, Shelly.com S H E L L Y E.com. I love your book. You know how much I love your book. <laughs> Thank you. The next word is skills. Keep learning. Keep learning. If you have not felt uncomfortable in your role in the last like 60 days, that means you're not learning because when you're learning, you feel uncomfortable because you don't know everything you're getting ready to face. So keep learning and you will build the skills you need. Oh, I love that. Time. Management. Time is the most precious resource we have. Because once it's gone, it's gone and there's no way to get it back. So be intentional and manage your time so that you're spending it the way you want to spend it. And we've talked about this recently because sometimes, you know, as women, we, we, we just have that innate, just nurturing instinct. We want to say yes to everybody and everything. You know, so, so recently I was asked to sit on a committee and I'm like, okay, <laughs> And I'm like, I don't really have the time to do this. And, I, and this is going to be difficult for me. Uh, and so really making sure, and you had given me the advice that, you know, I, I need to understand, you know, quick, a quick yes is not always going to be good, right? So sometime evaluating your time, evaluating that you have the time in your schedule to be able to do it before you actually commit to it is going to be the right thing to do. Right. Because <laughs> realize, realize when you say yes to one thing, by definition, you're saying no to something else. You just don't know what that is yet. So every time you say yes, you're closing doors on other things you could be doing. Oh, you got to save space then for those opportunities and those things that you want. Exactly. Oh, yep. Good advice. Energy. Exercise. Oh. I, I believe that exercising helps you improve your overall energy. And, and I don't mean you have to go to the gym and spend an hour a day, just taking a walk, doing something, but keep moving. That will help you build your energy. Oh, I'm trying to get better at that <laughs> right now. 
being more consistent. Ambition. This is the word of the day, ambition. I, I don't know if you remember when I first met you, I think I told you that for a long time, this word was hard for me because I was called ambitious in like a bad way. You know, people were like, oh, she's so ambitious. Oh, you know, you're so ambitious. You need to kind of tame it down. And so for a long time, I did not want to be called that. I was, if somebody called it to me, I would feel really bad. And it wasn't until I saw your book, I realized this is not a bad thing. <laughs> so ambition, <laughs> what, do you, what do you say to that? Yeah. Own it. Own your ambition. Ambition just means there's something in the future that you want to achieve, create, or impact. And you are working toward it. Everyone deserves to be ambitious. And you shouldn't have to apologize for it. You shouldn't have to hide it. Now, don't be rude. Don't walk around saying, okay, I'm going to do this. Everybody get out of my way, right? Blah, blah, blah. No, that, that's just being rude. But being ambitious, own it. Yeah. It's important to be ambitious so that you can work towards something. Oh, unapologetically ambitious. Love that. That's right. <laughs> and the last word is money. I'm going to come back to management again. It's being intentional, right? Again, money can be a powerful thing. It can also be, be something that causes you great grief and great challenge if you aren't being intentional and managing it well. So it is a resource, just like anything else is a resource. Make sure you are aligning your spending to your goals so that you can do what you want to do in the future. Oh, thank you so much, Shelly. It's been a pleasure having you on the OnlyFans podcast. I'm excited about what everybody's going to be able to take away. There were so many jam-packed, not just tweetables, but jam-packed advice that I'm sure everybody's going to be writing down and really taking, taking with them on their journey. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. I've enjoyed it. 